But Gadflo, the new king of the winter court, surprised us all. Singular among his people, he was all that other Fae were not. Aggressive, ambitious, visionary. He had power like none we had ever seen. Terrible and deadly. Hi guys, it's Jack here from the Zombie Box Project. If you are watching a previous episode, you'd know that Chris covered the Kingdoms of Amalur in a preview. Well, the demo was out this week, and I've played it for over a total time of three and a half hours, so I think I'm fully qualified to tell you everything that you need to know about the Kingdoms of Amalur, and if you should get it or not. The Kingdom of Amalur Reckoning is one of those games that rose out of nowhere, taking everyone by surprise. Over the past few weeks, the hype behind this game has slowly been rising, but now with the release of the demo, players can now get a great idea about what the final retail game is all about. Like I said, having spent over three and a half hours in the demo alone, I now have a pretty good idea of what Kingdom of Amalur contains. And trust me, guys, when I say it contains a hell of a lot. You're introduced to the world of Amalur through a cutscene not unlike the beginning to Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring. There's even a Galadriel-like character given a voiceover. It's very apparent that the developers drew strongly upon Tolkien's world as inspiration, but the negative effect of this was that I found myself looking out for connections between Amalur and Middle-earth, rather than appreciating Amalur's unique identity. The backstory is this. The world of Amalur contains a variety of races. The most powerful of these races is the race known as the Fae. They are immortal beings who look down at the younger races. Inside of the Fae there are various councils, and one of the heads of these councils, Gadflo has taken it upon himself to bring a new god to life while causing a ten year war that has swamped the world of Amalur. The younger races, also known as mortals, are losing the war against Gadflo and his army of Tuatha, a bloodthirsty version of the Fae, and have gone to desperate measures to turn the tide of the never ending war. Standard stuff really. <laughs> And that is where you come in, or more appropriately worded, rolling. The game brings you to present day as a being that has already died, being rolled in on a slab by two gnomes, who are very preoccupied with filling in a report, and thus character creation ensues. In the creation section you are given the option of four different races, and are not even going to attempt to pronounce their names. You can choose either to be male or female within each race. The interesting thing about the character creation is it pinpoints the spot where the role playing elements of Reckoning first come into play. Each race has its own ability. One race is more equipped for sorcery, and one is more equipped for stealth. It's standard stuff really, but it makes you think early on about what direction you want to take your character in and how you want to play out Reckoning. As I played through the demo twice, I created two very different characters. One of these was female, Aria, and the other male, Thorn. Bonus points if you can guess the link there. I created each one using a different race and chose to hone my skills in a variety of different ways. With Fawn, I practiced brute strength and my preferred weapon was a sword, whereas Arya focused more heavily upon magic and using a staff. I found that both characters were immensely satisfying to develop, and it only took a few levels for me to have fully planned out what direction I wanted to take them in. The beauty of Reckoning is that you aren't tied down to focusing on one set of skills. Of course, if you want to create a godlike magician, then you're best focusing on sorcery, but it's very easy to find a levelled course for all your characters. The levelling up system is broken down into three parts. Players have a skill section which is divided into nine separate sections such as alchemy, blacksmith and stealth, etc. You have one skill point to spend on an area so use it wisely guys. One skill that I would suggest right from the beginning is detect hidden, which makes hidden items show up on your minimap. There are a lot of items littered around Amalur so it's definitely worth your skill point. The second section is broken into three categories, finesse, sorcery and might. You're given more skill points to spend in these areas. These sections contain more specific talents such as charge attacks for a staff or passive abilities that grant more damage to your weapons. It's presented in a branch system where you have to spend X number of points before the next part of the branch is unlocked. This makes sure your character doesn't become overpowered in the earlier sections of the game, but it also means the more points you invest in a specific area, the greater the reward. The third and final section is unlocked once you've spoken to the Fate Weaver. You are able to choose cards, also known as destinies, that grant you a bonus and helps you follow and develop a specific path. You can even choose a card that grants you no bonus, which is a nice touch for those players who don't want to be tied down by a specific destiny. 
These cards are set into tiers and as you develop in the game you unlock higher tiers which offer even bigger bonuses. As a whole the levelling up system works very well in Reckoning. It may be a bit confusing at first but once you get the hang of it you can really manipulate your character to your liking. The levelling up system really reflects the nature of Reckoning. It's as deep as you want it to be. Now I'm going to draw an inevitable comparison here guys. The combat in Reckoning is everything that Fable 3 should have been. It's fluid and fun and when you land hits or deflect say a wolf's bite with your shield there feels like there's weight to it. The weapon classes are broken down like everything in Reckoning, intersections. You have long swords which are perfect for your middle ground players as well as players who are focusing on might. Long swords are neither fast nor slow and deal out a fair amount of damage. Swords can also have lingering effects such as poisoning an enemy for a set amount of time. Daggers are the stealthy player's best choice. You dual wield a pair of daggers which hit fast but aren't the strongest of all weapons. They are perfect for the players who like to sneak up on their opponents and destroy them with an execution. Maybe not the best for open fighting, daggers are for players who like to destroy their enemies before they can even scream. The staff or scepter is much slower than the other two but it hits the hardest. They are instilled with magic which can have a lingering effect on your foes. The staff is best for hitting your enemies hard enough that you are pretty sure they won't be getting up. Alongside the three choices of weapon, you can also assign a secondary weapon. My secondary weapon of choice was the bow. The strange thing about archery and reckoning is that you don't go around picking up arrows. You are assigned a specific number of arrows that recharges over time. Having only five arrows in the early stages of the game means you can't be forever firing at your foes. However, you do have the option to charge up your shots, allowing you to hit harder but slower. Alongside all of this, you have the ranged magic attacks. These are limited as they eat up points, but they allow you to hit your enemies from a distance with a variety of different effects. The one you start off with is the lightning strike that hits your enemies causing sufficient damage. Once you've racked up enough kills and filled up your fate meter, you can enter what is known as reckoning mode. In this mode you are much stronger and much faster. It runs until your meter runs out or you fate shift. To fate shift is to use your remaining fate energy and perform an execution. In other words, a quick time event that destroys all your foes and it also grants you a nice experience bonus. While playing, I tended to use Reckoning Mode for bigger battles where I knew I would need everything at my disposal to get through it. The combat at times could benefit from having a lock-on system. There are moments in this game, especially when dealing with range attacks in larger battles, that my attacks didn't land because I hadn't aimed them properly. However, to include a targeting system would probably have damaged the free-flowing combat that makes Reckoning so enjoyable. In battle you can also assign items to the d-pad, allowing you to access them in the middle of a battle. Health and magic potions are commonly needed in larger battles, and having them assigned to the d-pad is especially helpful. The great thing about Reckoning's combat system is the enemies though. Each one has its own vulnerabilities and resistances. It is finding these that makes the combat in Reckoning so worthwhile. One of the first larger creatures you come across in Reckoning is a rock troll. In this battle you really have to mix up your strategy to find out the best way of bringing down this monster. Not only are the weapons at your disposal varied, so are the enemies. The story behind Kingdom of Amalur Reckoning is an interesting one, or at least what I've played of it. Instead of being a hero who has the destiny to overthrow a Dark Lord, the developers have turned this idea on its head and you are referred to as Fateless. It's an interesting concept. You, the player, have total freedom over your character's destiny. This is extended to what quests you choose to play, and even what you have to say. Dialogue is presented in a style almost identical to Mass Effect. Players have a dialogue selection wheel from which they can choose a variety of different things to say. If there is too much to say, then the game presents your options as a list. There are options to persuade people for good or for bad, however, what you say never seems to have a permanent effect on your character, and this is a shame as it means the dialogue choices are effectively redundant. There are a variety of side quests available to the player as well as the main quest. The side quests, like everything in Reckoning, is split up into sections. You have faction quests as well as a variety of other quests. Of all the quests I played in the demo, the one that will stick with me for a while is the quest of turning a man back into a wolf. It wasn't what I had to do in the quest that made it so enjoyable, it was just a standard fetch quest. What made it so enjoyable was the characterisation. I found this hobbling man in the wild and he had such depth to his character that he made Amalur feel like a living, breathing world. Thank you, Two Legs, but the task will not be easy. Be warned, the sprites have much magic. 
If you're a lover of role-playing games, then Kingdom of Amalur Reckoning is for you. There is an insane amount of depth to Reckoning, so much so that there's pretty much a load of stuff that I haven't covered in this video. It goes as deep as you want it to go. I haven't mentioned the lock picking, I haven't mentioned the armour, there's a lot of things I haven't mentioned. I could invest hours into Reckoning and not even realise it. If you're one of those casual players who find yourself being a bit overwhelmed by RPG elements, then I could still recommend Reckoning to you. It doesn't quite have the charm that Fable possesses, but it isn't quite as serious as Fallout or Elder Scrolls games. Reckoning finds a nice middle ground. Because of this it feels unique and I would totally recommend it to anyone who enjoys gaming. The full written article can be found on www.x3news.co.uk. I've been Jack from the Zombie Box Project guys. Remember to like, comment and subscribe and we'll be back next Tuesday, all three of us, because we're back at uni.